Hi guys, Katie Lee CGC here and welcome back to my channel. I am fired up today. I'm fired up about a few things, fired up about work, but also I am fired up about people being confused about their karyotypes, whether they should get one or not. Today, I'm going to be talking about whether uh, somebody with recurrent pregnancy loss, a history of multiple miscarriages, should consider getting a karyotype. What is a karyotype? Why might you want to consider it? And how would things change if you had an abnormal karyotype result? The reason I'm filming this video today is because I'm in a few different recurrent miscarriage Facebook groups that are pretty big because of my history with recurrent miscarriage. And I see this question asked multiple times a week. And I am so sad that providers are not explaining what each test is for. Like, what is that karyotype for? And what would we do for you if the result came back abnormal? Um, you guys, if you're not sure why you're having a test done and it's a, an expensive one, like a karyotype, a karyotype can be a really expensive blood test. You should ask your provider, what is the test for? What are you going to do differently when it's abnormal? And don't feel bad about it because, you know, as patients, unfortunately, we have to advocate for ourselves and we may be absolutely not in the mood to advocate for ourselves, but sometimes we just we need to. So don't feel bad asking all of those questions. You have the right to know exactly what type of testing you're paying for and why. And you have the right to have the correct information from the providers you're paying to make a knowledgeable decision about what type of testing you want to opt into or opt out of. Today, I will fill in as your genetic counselor and talk to you all about karyotyping. I have had karyotyping done, as has my partner, as part of our recurrent pregnancy loss workup. It is one of those things that I hesitated on compared to others on the workup just because it is fairly pricey and the hit rate's pretty low. So let's get into it. Let's begin with what is a karyotype? I had to go get some water. I'm so fired up. Okay. Karyotyping is a technique where the chromosomes are visualized. How do you do that? You need a sample of blood. You should remember from ninth grade biology that the chromosomes are the containers that house the genes. And genes are like individual instruction manuals for how a protein in the body is made. A chromosomally normal individual, I'm going to say that instead of just a normal individual, will have 46 chromosomes. And those 46 chromosomes come from two sets. One set of 23 chromosomes that came from the egg cell, my mom's egg cell that went to make me. One set of 23 chromosomes that came from my dad's sperm cell that went to make me. And then all of the resulting cells, as I was a little embryo dividing, each had 46 chromosomes. So there should be 46 chromosomes in essentially every cell of my body, whether we're talking about skin, blood, heart, whatever it may be. That is what can be determined on a karyotype. Most people have normal karyotypes. A normal karyotype would just mean that 46 chromosomes were present and no rearrangements were identified. The goal of karyotyping for individuals with recurrent pregnancy loss is to rule out chromosome rearrangements that are called translocations or inversions. And now I know I'm throwing a lot of technical terms at you, so hang on with me. It doesn't really matter what the terms are. We want to see on a karyotype, is any material inverted? Is any material on two chromosomes swapped around? Because if there's material that's in a different position than usual because of a translocation or inversion, you may be at an increased risk for infertility or for miscarriages and or for pregnancies that are affected with specific birth defects or neurological differences. We want to figure out if an abnormal karyotype could be one of the reasons that you've experienced recurrent miscarriages or infertility. Let's talk about who recommends karyotype and why. The American Society of Reproductive Medicine, or ASRM, um, they recommend karyotype on all people with recurrent pregnancy loss, all individuals with two or more clinical pregnancy losses. They report that within 2-5% to 5 of couples with recurrent pregnancy loss, there will be a chromosome structural rearrangement, an abnormal result detected on a karyotype. Their recommendation is different from ESHRA's. ESHRA is the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. While Escher agrees that an abnormal karyotype can be a contributing factor to infertility or recurrent miscarriages, they state that because the incidence of abnormal karyotypes in RPL couples is so low, they actually don't necessarily recommend karyotyping. They actually only recommend parental karyotyping in RPL couples after an individual risk assessment. They state that parental karyotyping can be recommended based on genetic history, 
For instance, in the case of a birth of a previous child with congenital abnormalities, birth defects, offspring with unbalanced chromosome abnormalities, or the detection of a translocation in pregnancy tissue. For other couples, the benefit of testing is limited, as the chances of finding an abnormality are very low. In couples with females above age 39, less than three pregnancy losses and a negative family history, the chance of being a carrier of a translocation is extremely low. The recommendations differ, and this is common. There's not a right or a wrong, and karyotyping can be a really expensive test. It can cost upwards to like $1,000 per person, and both the egg source and the sperm source should have karyotyping done if you want to go that route because a chromosome imbalance could come from a chromosome rearrangement in either egg source or sperm source. So it can be a pricey test. On the flip side of that, I've also heard of people getting it fully covered by insurance. Let's say you fall into that 2 to 5% of couples where the result is abnormal. What is going to be different this time around? The first thing is, one, you've got a little bit of an explanation as to a contributing factor to your infertility or recurrent miscarriages. This could explain some of the miscarriages. This could explain the challenge with getting pregnant potentially. Two, you also know for your future children and for family members like siblings and cousins that this translocation very well is in your family. So for offspring, there's a chance they could inherit this chromosome rearrangement from the parent who has it, but they won't need to go through, you know, two years of infertility or miscarriages because you can tell them about it and you can get them tested for it to figure out whether they have it or not. And you can explain to them as they're growing up, if they do have the translocation or inversion, what their options are, which you can only imagine how much those options are going to change in the next 20 to 30 years. Now, what might change for your treatment? If you are going the route of IVF or IVF is on the table and you or your partner, the egg source or the sperm source is identified to carry a translocation or an inversion, it is likely that your provider will recommend genetic testing on the embryos called PGT pre-implantation genetic testing. There's a specific type of genetic testing that we use when individuals carry a translocation or an inversion, and it is called PGTSR, pre-implantation genetic testing for structural rearrangements. With this form of testing, um, what a laboratory can do is essentially zoom in to the regions of the chromosomes that are at risk of being imbalanced, and it can determine with a high level of accuracy, usually about 98%, whether each of the embryos has a balanced set of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, or whether each embryo has a chromosome imbalance. Again, those imbalances can happen at a higher rate if the egg source or the sperm source has a chromosome structural rearrangement, like a translocation or an inversion. Your doctor may perhaps recommend prenatal testing, testing during pregnancy, like amniocentesis or CVS, which can look for chromosome imbalances during the pregnancy. That might be recommended if you decide to conceive naturally. It also might be recommended as a follow-up if you do PGTSR because it has a higher accuracy than 98%. Even if you are identified to carry a translocation or an inversion, one of these structural rearrangements, there's still not a right or wrong decision as to what to do next. You need to speak with your doctor and make an individual assessment. But I will read this quote from Eshra. Regarding prognosis, couples should be informed that even if a parental abnormality is found after karyotyping, the cumulative live birth rates are good, as are the chances of a healthy live born child, despite a higher risk of pregnancy loss. So what that means is if you or your sperm source, the egg source or the sperm source has a translocation or a clinically significant inversion, and you don't have a problem getting pregnant or conceiving, you could potentially keep trying naturally. And they say the prognosis is pretty good. It's it's fairly likely that you would have a healthy live-born baby at some point. However, you also may experience more miscarriages, which I know I've been through five, takes a big, huge toll, especially if you've already been through a bunch. Now, while the risk for an affected child, a child with birth defects or intellectual disability, and the list could go on and on is low, that risk is there. That risk is definitely there, and it's elevated compared to somebody who does not have a clinically significant inversion or translocation. 
So that's something you want to speak with your provider about. And you might want to try to reduce that risk by utilizing that genetic testing on embryos, PGTSR. You also may be able to reduce your risk for miscarriage by utilizing PGTSR. Because with that testing, you and your doctor are going to be able to identify embryos that don't have missing or extra chromosomes and only transfer those, reducing the risk for miscarriage. Now, I could go on about this topic forever. There are lots of little exceptions to the rules and other considerations and things to be aware of, but I wanted to make a really quick guide for somebody who says, my doctor recommended karyotype, it's $400 per person, should I do it? And I said at the beginning, I'd mentioned my experience, I procrastinated on it. I procrastinated on it for a long time because I knew the hit rate was so low. And also I don't have a very fishy family history for a chromosome imbalance. I would have been more concerned if there were a bunch of miscarriages on either side of the family or if there was a kiddo who's been born with birth defects and it was due to a chromosome imbalance or maybe the reason was never determined. But we just don't have that. We did the testing. It was pretty expensive. They both came back normal. If your results come back normal on karyotype, it's just not going to change anything. And I'm just like checking another test off your long list of tests to consider. Now, if you have questions about your karyotype results or want me to explain exactly what a translocation or inversion is and really get into the details, I would be more than happy to make a video about that. Let me know down below. All right, guys, take care. Bye.